Hello, this is Manny Ramos, your host of Rise Up, Real Issues and Stories of Every One of Us podcast. But first, let me talk about who we are. I'm Manny Ramos, a board member of PNAA and a past president of the Philippine Nurses Association of Central Florida. I'm a professor of nursing at Valencia College in Orlando and an adjunct faculty at William Patterson University. With me today is my co-host, Mindy Ofiana. Mindy? Thank you, Manny. Welcome, everyone. I'm Mindy Ofiana, Legislative Committee Chair for PNAA, Corresponding Secretary for PNAA Foundation, and past president of PNA Southern California. Before my retirement, I served as both a Chief Operations Officer and a Chief Nursing Officer at one of the medical centers owned by KPC Group of Companies. Manny? Thank you, Mindy. We're honored to join us today and rise up Dr. Jeanette Lavello. Jeanette is the nurse director of the Medical Intensive Care Unit at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. She currently serves as the executive director of the Filipino Cancer Network of New England Foundation, Inc., and is the past president of PNA New England. Dr. Lavello received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Far Eastern University a Master of Science and a Master's in Business Administration from the University of Massachusetts. She earned her Doctor of Nursing practice from Regis College Institute of Nursing. Dr. Livello served as a PNAA Executive Board Member for nearly two decades and is a PNAA Leadership Fellow and received multiple leadership and management awards. Good evening, Jeanette. Welcome to Rise Up. Thank you, Manny. And uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mindy. Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to have me here presenting to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, first, we'd like to find out, uh, Jeanette, where are you from? Uh, were you born here or in the Philippines? I was born in, the, in Marinduque in the Philippines. It's oh. a small island. But uh, when my mom and dad uh, got married, they moved to Oriental Mindoro. It's a P Pinamalayan. It's a small um, town, almost close to Romblon, which is Visayas. So when I, I speak Tagalog, they thought I was a Visayan uh, mm -hmm. because we're close to the region of Visaya. But I'm Tagalog. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. when I... Um, when I went to school in Manila, uh, I was 16 years old for my BSN. I moved to Manila and I never really went back home unless, you know, for vacation. Mm. Um, and mm -hmm. so uh, I graduated in 1980. Um, it's the four year course. That's why it's called ATB. And mm -hmm. I work at the Philippine Heart Center for Asia uh, at the surgical ICU for almost four years before I migrated to the United States in New York City in 1985. I see. Yeah. So why did you become... Oh, I'm sorry, Jeanette. <laughs> yes, go I ahead, go ahead. Boston when my, um, my sister uh, arrived here in Boston, she's also a nurse. It was in 1989. So we moved here in Boston since then. Yeah. Mm, um, Cindy, you ha you're asking yeah, me something. My, yeah, yeah, my question was, why did you become a nurse? <laughs> when I was growing up, I think I was three years old, and my aunt is a nurse, and I, I was just looking at her, and I said, I want to wear white, and I had my cap on at three years old, always looking at the mirror, and so every time I draw someone, it's a nurse. Oh. So it never really faded. I mean, I knew when I went on elementary, they ask you, what do you want to be in the future? And I always want to be a nurse. Oh. And um, at, at one point, yeah, I did thought about chemical engineering because I was really good at math. Mm. But then my, my grandfather told me that I'm too skinny. The chemicals might go <laughs> in and then I'll get, I'll get more skinny. And he says, no, just go do nursing. So I did. Mm. I'm very happy to be a nurse. That's yeah. good. Yes. Yes. And uh, you're, you're doing very well. And, and uh, we actually uh, want to thank you for all of the contributions and, and the things that you bring to PNAA. And I'm sure uh, as a, uh, a nurse director there at MassGen. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, you as a nurse director in a medical ICU and COVID. Uh, what has it been like running an ICU during the pandemic? Yes. Um, 
it was tough. I think, I, I don't know if you heard, like my mom and I went back home to the Philippines in February mm. and we didn't really um, set foot on the ground. We were fr- we flew back to um, San Francisco, oh. Hong Kong and San Francisco, because at that time, uh, our president um, did not allow us to disembark because I'm an oh. American citizen and my mom forgot her Philippine passport. So we were we were sent back to the United States and I was quarantined for two weeks. So that was February 3 two when weeks. we arrived back to the United States. I quarantined for two weeks. There's a couple of instances already in Seattle, Washington, and then one, a student in Boston. The whole um, hospital has been preparing for a potential um, outbreak. Mm -hmm. So we knew that it may happen. Um, And and what happened is that I came back to work on the February 17th. We're preparing for something until the end of February at the conclusion of the Biogen conference. Uh, we were uh-huh. told that there were some exposure that happened. But then by that time, about uh, more than 100 of attendees already flew back to their uh, to the different states. Mm-hmm. And so they tra- started contact tracing. It was the first weekend uh-huh. of March when the governor said yeah. that we certainly have an outbreak at the um, at Boston and so we Mm -hmm. made a makeshift um, in the ambulance area for testing and so it was a Friday afternoon I already went home and I heard this call because my unit the MECU is the Ebola Mm -hmm. response team of the hospital and of region one so my staff were the first one to be tapped to go to that um, uh-huh. makeshift center to do some testing because they know how to don and doff yeah. uh, PPE. Right. And so um, I, I said, should I come back to work? And they said, no, no, stay put. I think we're in control. Mm-hmm. And um, that weekend, there's already several patients that came to the, to the MICU, but not mm-hmm. COVID. It's like rule out respiratory infection uh-huh. is what they, mm-hmm. they, um, they diagnosed them with. But it's like one after the other, that whole week from March 6th to March 13th, we filled up our intensive care unit. Oh, wow. And, um, and by the time I came back, like over the weekend, I was on the phone all the time. I was going to work very early, going home late at night. I wasn't sleeping well. I wasn't eating oh, well. Right. Um, unfortunately, I'm due for a colonoscopy on March 16th. I believe it was a Monday and um, after that weekend it's it's been very tense and stressful Mm -hmm. we have a lot of patients who are dying already about three of them simultaneously because and they're young uh, professionals Uh because they had full-blown COVID and of course nobody knows how to take care of them first Mm -hmm. at that time and so when I was went home because I have a three-day weekend off uh, because of my colonoscopy on Monday. Uh, when I went to the hospital, I had a slight fever, very low-grade oh, fever. Oh. And so I, they let me stay there for a little while, about an hour. And then my gastroenterologist came down and they said, uh, we talk about your case, but we really cannot do your colonoscopy with you having a low-grade fever. And I uh-huh. was telling them, mm-hmm. it's probably because I was dehydrated. Uh-huh. And they said, no, mm-hmm. I think, you know, the COVID right now, we cannot take the chance. So they sent me home. Uh-huh. And and so I called my, my hospital and I said, um, you know, I can't come back to work now. They didn't really give me any sedation. And uh-huh. they said, no, stay there. Mm-hmm. We're doing fine. But then that <laughs> night, I had uh-huh. um, my fever uh-huh. went up and then it's, uh-huh. I have a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms. I keep going to the restroom. I thought it was neurovirus. Mm-hmm. I was not paying attention mm-hmm. to it. But on the third day, um, I was told by, by um, the hospital that I should get tested. Uh-huh. So I drove mm-hmm. myself to the hospital. I got the flu, vac- uh, flu test and also the um, COVID-19 test. The flu test mm-hmm. came back 48 hours later, it was negative. And that's when I felt like, oh, my God, I hope this is not COVID. Mm-hmm. I was still doing fine. Mm-hmm. So I stayed home mm-hmm. uh, because of the weekend. We don't have the rapid testing at that time yet. 
It uh-huh. took about, yeah. it's like three days. They said you, it will turn around within yeah. three days. So it was Wednesday afternoon when I had it. The three days is Saturday. So they kind of hold it because there's no testing going on on weekend. And I finally got mm-hmm. the result on Tuesday about um, seven days later. Uh-huh. But then mm-hmm. I was not doing very well at the time, but I'm still in denial. Uh-huh. Um, I went to the re- um emergency room prior to the test coming out and I requested to be brought back home Uh I said I'll just come I'll stay there they gave me a liter of fluid and because I was so dehydrated it was my CNO um three days later after the test came back uh, she called me and while we were talking she said to me you know, you need to call, you want me to call 911. And I said, oh, why? why? I said, mm-hmm. you don't sound good, Jeanette. And I said, what do you mean? I'm fine. I said, no, you're so short of breath. I didn't even oh, realize wow. it. I got so used to it, maybe. Uh-huh. And they said, you need to, uh-huh. you need to come to the hospital now. And so mm-hmm. Rochi and my sister um, brought me because mm-hmm. I said, no, don't call 911. <laughs> I'll have someone <laughs> bring me to the hospital. Right after that, um, they direct, admitted me to the ED for a short period. And then the x-ray was full-blown COVID on my left oh, lung wow. and also some yeah. pockets on the right. Mm-hmm. So they brought me to the wow. ICU and they want to intubate me. Oh. Mm-hmm. I oh. beg, I said, please don't intubate me. I think I'll be fine. Just give me a few uh, mm-hmm. days because I really don't feel like I'm short of breath, but my oxygen saturation is plummeting down to 85 every, every wow. time I, mm-hmm. I speak. Mm-hmm. And so I said, but I said, yeah. can you try something else? And they gave me this um, nitric yeah. oxide um, mm-hmm. via a BiPAP mask. And uh-huh. I had that uh, yeah. twice a day. Uh-huh. I lasted for three days, but on the third on Sunday. Uh, so I was admitted Thursday on that Sunday. I was so tired. Uh-huh. And I knew, I knew then that I needed to be intubated. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, so that was it. I, I was the one who told me, yeah, go ahead. You can intubate me. I really thought I'm going to die because that's oh, what wow. I saw with my patients in the medical ICU prior to me getting getting um, uh-huh. uh, sick. Uh-huh. So I thought mm-hmm. like, oh, this is it. And oh. um, uh-huh. yeah. And after that, I was intubated, sedated, paralyzed, oh. um, very hemodynamically unstable. I was prone. 16 hours a day. Um, I had my fever was up to 103. They think I'm going to have seizure, but mm-hmm. I didn't know anything because I'm already oh. sedated and paralyzed. Oh, I see. Um, the, right. the struggle I had was more when I was extubated the first time. I had a lot of delirium and confusion. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, and wow. I didn't even know that I didn't have a voice. And so they needed to reintubate me to prevent um, my, my larynx from. Um, mm-hmm. closing because uh-huh. it was so swollen uh-huh. I might end up wow. being trach um, oh, wow. and so I had a lot of, of, of dreams and nightmares uh-huh. during that time frame thank god I was extubated two days later the second extubation uh-huh. uh, but I was so weak it was um, 14 days later that um, oh, wow. I was finally able to get out of the ICU went to the regular floor for seven days and then rehab for another eight days and then home. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So that's my story. Um, <laughs> so, yes. The sad part, because you asked me about how did I do um, when I came back to work, I was excited to come back to work. My PCP and the o- occupational health nurse said that uh-huh. it may take six mm-hmm. months for me to recover, and they don't mm-hmm. want me to go back to work because they said I may, might have PTSD seeing the same place that I was when I was sick. And I said, I need to find out if I can do it because Mm -hmm. um, if you don't let me come back, I will not know. Uh Uh, Thank God I did well, but it was tough because my staff was really um, hurting. They were so worried about me. They were excited I'm back, but they're guarded because it's like, is she really okay? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. With Um, all, um, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeanette. Um, I think the 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 most challenge I had was to make sure that my staff are remain cohesive because they told mm-hmm. me they felt like they were split up because mm-hmm. because we're the biothreat treatment 
um, center. Uh-huh. My staff has been deployed to different ICUs so that they can train other nurses. Uh-huh. And so they said they were split into four. Like they went to went, um, mm-hmm. makeshift ICU. The other team stayed in the MICU, but very understaffed. They have like nine ECMOs out of 18 beds. Wow. And they are doubling patients and they are matched with a med surge nurse. Then there are those who sought um, accommodation, which means they are brought to the... Um, a late lighter assignment uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, and then the others stayed home I they see. were allowed to stay at home because they're mm-hmm. immunosuppressed so they felt they were not the same team anymore yeah. and that was really the challenge I had is to get them back together I see yeah so with all that because experience I, I, oh with all that experience that you have Jeanette how are you now how are you I'm feeling really better I um I I feel that self-care is so important. I think that's one thing that I would advise everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, say no, take care of yourself. Um, I also know that there was one comment that I received from one of the staff when we were having a resilience rounds. And I, I made a comment to one of the staff that I said, I'm so sorry you feel that way. Um, I feel for you. And she mm-hmm. says to me out of the blue, she says, how will you know how to feel, Jeanette? You were not even here. Oh, so that was yes. hurtful. Yeah. But I, I kept yeah. my, my, my focus and I said, they must be really hurting to say that. Uh-huh. And so um, I, I, I conducted several focus groups so that they can express their, their, um, their lived experiences. And it was so helpful mm-hmm. because everyone, they learned about what, what, I've been through. They wanted to learn about mm-hmm. what did you do? What is it true that um, patients who are intubated, sedated, and paralyzed are confused or delirious? I said, yes, it is true. <laughs> so they wanted to hear that. Um, and out of that focus group, I was able to send staff to different um, committees when we did the search planning. All of them are represented. Mm-hmm. And also, I told my um, my ACNO that, you know, as soon as I came back, I mean, I cannot see them struggling to get some help. I'm going to hire. And she says, mm-hmm. how many are you going to hire? I says, as many as I can. Uh-huh. And she approved mm-hmm. it. Uh, so I was oh. overhired by about uh, 10 FTEs. Mm-hmm. But I'm so glad I did. Uh-huh. I'm so, um, uh-huh. I like right now, there's a lot of movement going on. Uh-huh. And I just keep feeling right. them. I mean, I have a lineup of people wanting to go to the MICU, but I hired 26 nurses uh-huh. um, wow. in in less than 15 months. They're oh, wow. like, like four, three, two, one every month. And until now, I have another new grad and I hired another three. So by the end of December, I hired a total of 30 nurses for 18 months. Wow. And that really helped because I, I mean... I have an 18-bed ICU, and I could provide one-to-one staffing. On top of that, I have the resource nurse on top of everything because, I mean, they're newer mm-hmm. nurses, you know, yeah. less experience. Right. So you need the support. And I'm so glad I did that because some of my colleagues didn't do it, and they're struggling, you know. And I'm still mm-hmm. hiring travelers on top of everything. Oh, wow. Like I said to them, finance yeah. will come second. Right now, I need manpower on the bedside. No, ner- no right. nurse, we cannot take care of this patient. Mm-hmm. So uh, that has been my mantra until I now, see. and it's worked. Yeah. It really worked. Okay. Yeah. So you talked about that original group that you, you, you know, you're, I'm, sh- I'm, I'm assuming you had like um, a core group of nurses who's probably been there for some time with a lot of experiences. Mm-hmm. Uh, how are they now? Did that group, you, you also mentioned about some of them being distributed across the hospital. Right. Uh, are they all back together? Yeah. Uh, how, how are so, they? So uh, when, I, when I did a focus group, I was able to get them back together. Like the, pe- mm-hmm. the, the staff that wanted to leave nursing or go to another area when I was returning, mm-hmm. I was able to talk them into staying. Mm-hmm. And they stayed. I really, the only... Yeah. Out of all the staff that I had, it's about 140 of them. Only two left mm-hmm. in December of 2020 because one went to New Hampshire because of her husband. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is so tired of traveling from the uh, 
from the from New Hampshire border and Massachusetts. She says it takes me about an hour and a half to go to Boston. Mm -hmm. So she got a job closer to where she lives. Yeah. Those are the only two that I lost in 2020. I see. I got everybody back in. Wow. There's a very different style right now of um of the nurses, they are leaving, uh -huh. uh, going to other places in the hospital, like the infusion center, ambulatory. Mm -hmm. Like I, I lost three of them, um, November and then two in December. They're still with me, mm -hmm. but they're moving. And then when two went to travel nursing, so that's five. So I lost them, yeah. but that's it. I, I didn't lose anybody else from that 140. Um, it was originally 120, but then I added more staff. So my turnover rate is still below. Uh, it's around 4% turnover rate wow. in Massachusetts. Wow. And my um, That's rate is less than 2%. That's great. But I'm anticipating it will not be like that in 2022. I have a feeling I'm going to lose mm -hmm. some people. Um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily because they don't like the job anymore or they don't like um, being in the MECU. But during the mm -hmm. pandemic, I usually have, uh, prior to pandemic, I usually have about three or five nurses that goes to grad school. They become nurse practitioner or CRNA. So I keep replacing them like that for like a promotion. But during the pandemic, mm -hmm. 11 nurses went to grad school. Wow. So they're going to be graduating now in May. It's a two years one. Yeah. Yes. So I have to replace them. And that's how it's been. Um, it's interesting because I was telling my colleagues, I'm not really losing them because they don't want to be in the MICU. I'm losing them because they're going to be promoted. They went to school, grad school, and I'm very happy for that. So um, uh -huh. so it's exciting that, you know, they're looking at the career um, move. But I'm also thinking that I got to have to speed up with recruitment because the 2022 mm -hmm. will be a lot more different than 2020 see the 2020 mm -hmm. we are thinking that the pandemic will be over in a year but mm -hmm. now we're almost on the second year Third. and i really feel that my staff are tired oh, very tired yeah. especially when we take care of patients who are unvaccinated they're not vaccinated yeah. it's like Jeanette. I, I i don't know i mean this is my my role this is my 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 ethical part of me, my moral moral mm -hmm. part of me tells me that I should take care of their patient. But when I think about my family, that I'm mm -hmm. putting them at mm -hmm. risk, do you know, it's that's that's the kind of conversation I'm having with them now. I see. Yeah. You yeah. talked um, about oh, is big. Yeah. You talked about um recruiting. Um, more than mm -hmm. FTEs that you need and you did a good job, even though these individuals are being promoted. Uh, you're still going to be having more FTEs. Where did you get them? <laughs> <laughs> no, really. <laughs> I, <I'm, laughs> that's a great question, Mindy. Because we're having I'm, a hard time here in California. <laughs> we're a finance person. I um I love numbers. <laughs> and the funny thing is that we have an acuity system. Mm -hmm. And I was begging the nurses, you got to have to document document your epic put everything in there that will translate to the number mm -hmm. of FTEs that I will ask every time the budget process comes in mm -hmm. um, keep the beds full whenever it gets empty get another patient in don't delay because it will translate to FTE so volume and acuity equals FTE and I tell this to the staff very much they know it already yeah. and that's how I get them I see. like I already forecasted and I will tell them that you know in three months from now these are the people that are leaving because they will be getting um, another position they don't have a position mm -hmm. yet, but I know they will be because I'm going to help them find a nurse practitioner job or CRNA. Mm -hmm. So I speak to my ICNO and my CNO, and I said, I need to make sure I have I have to be ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. And they approved me. I mean, That's it's really good. it because they know. I mean, I never close beds. The staff, even though they are down, like, um, like if the acuity is high, and there's only like mm -hmm. less than 60 nurses when in fact they should have 18. Mm -hmm. They they do, they they work around it so that I don't have to mm -hmm. close bed or delay any admission. They they know 
they know it's good for them anyway. Sure. So that's how I get them. <laughs> it's, it's, I it's am not amazed. <laughs> a lot of um, moving targets and a lot of uh, teamwork and cooperation from the staff. Yeah. I would not have done it without them, without that's their true. help. That's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So Jeanette, um, I'm sure, uh, you know, with all of these things that has happened, uh, you know, during this pandemic, how has, is the composition now of your staff, uh, staff, uh, uh, is there like a significant difference as far as that you, you were telling us uh, you've been hiring, uh, how's the composition now of, of your staff uh, compared to the start of pandemic and yeah. now? So yeah. I've been in Mass General for eight years. And uh, one of the things that I do every year is do a pie graph. You know, you know me, mm-hmm. Manny and Mindy, they know yeah. I like the graphs. Yeah. So I do that. I present yeah. it to the staff. I present it to my boss. And um, and in the very beginning, I have about, it's kind of lopsided. I have 50% more seasoned staff, meaning they are mm-hmm. like anybody that's 10 years and above. Mm-hmm. And then uh, about mm-hmm. 25% are five years to 10 years. And mm-hmm. then another 25% are zero to five years. And then as, as mm-hmm. I started working on FTEs, like every year, I add three to four FTEs. Since mm. I've been there, mm-hmm. um, so in doing that, I kind of sliced the pie a little bit differently. So I mm-hmm. made it four, like you know, the first uh, twenty years and above, ten years and above, five and mm-hmm. one. So for the last yeah. four years, it's been the same. It's like starting the newer staff, which is zero to five years, mm-hmm. are starting to grow because mm-hmm. I'm adding. Mm-hmm. So they are between yeah. fifty to sixty percent. Mm-hmm. And then the seasoned nurse are about 30%. And then the other 20 is between 10 to 20. I see. And so now mm-hmm. it does change a little bit again. I just, I mean, in fact, on Thursday, I have a leadership retreat. So I'm showing them right now the, um, the, those who are zero to five are mm-hmm. still 60%. Oh. But the zero to one year it's about 30% already. Mm-hmm. So which means that, you know, I have a very young group of nurses. Yeah, yeah it's right. still 60%, right. but then the zero to, to one year is half of that 60%. Yeah, so a lot of the focus now is uh, making sure that A, they stay for their second year. Mm-hmm. Number two, make mm-hmm. sure that they are competent enough and get their skill set up to snuff like the season nurses Mm -hmm. and then three Mm -hmm. i wanted to make sure i know their career path so that i can forecast that you know i'll be happy if they stay with me for the next two years that's true Uh, in the past it's usually three years and above now Uh i it's realistic for me to think that they will stay with me at least for two years because I'm going to talk them into going back to school. So now the two years will, you know, they still need to stay with me uh-huh. until they graduate. Mm-hmm. And that's how it's been my strategy. Oh, I see. Yeah. A great strategy. I mean, you you do good <laughs> forecasting. Uh, I wish yeah. I, I've learned that from you when I was a CNO. However, um, it here at, in California, in Southern California, we've done so mm-hmm. much creative staffing. I don't know if your ratios are... Uh, legislated or mandated, uh, and uh, yeah. here we have to apply. The, oh, before I answer that, what strategies did you do when really when you're really short? So I when I, when we're really short. So um, when we're like I said, um, I probably don't feel the void as much because the staff really um, rally. To make sure, mm. like mm-hmm. like today, this morning, um, I have only 14 staff members. Three, they're supposed to be 17. Three of them got sick, so they're uh-huh. down to 14. Uh-huh. Then I have the resource nurse and I have the attending nurse. So technically, I have um, 16 nurses. Oh. And, I, they, mm-hmm. and, and I saw them working. It's like it's really a team effort. Uh-huh. Uh, so a, a few of the nurses have two assignments and then they have to have an admission. But then the resource nurse and then and the attending nurse are helping them out. I see. So I never really um, experienced that that I have shortage. I they see. they really work mm-hmm. very hard. 
my colleagues, though, in other ICU, like one of them are texting me. It's like, do you have any travel nurses that can spare? <laughs> because they, um, they, I, I said, like, I was talking to my CNO uh, this morning and I said to her, you know, it really is because she asked me, how'd you do it? How come you're not closing bed? It seems like you're not stressed out with staffing. And I said, you know, it's the culture of the MICU. I mean, you set that from the minute that you run the unit, you tell them this is what you want. They know what my staffing look like. They know why we need the nurses. They know about acuity or docu- documentation, but it doesn't happen overnight. Mm-hmm. You know, you train them to mm-hmm. be like that. So I think for my other colleagues, I think that's what they should do. Yeah. It's like really train the nur- mm-hmm. nurses to be a team player. Don't look at numbers. Yeah. Like, so, okay, I am one, one to one or one to two. Don't look at it that way. Yeah. Look at what you can produce as a team. You know, you, one of you yeah. might be able to have a three patient assignment, but you have the resource nurse to help you. Help you. So, I, I mean, not really that they have three patient assignment, but it feels like that because yeah. of the acuity. Mm-hmm. I, I am really mm-hmm. hopeful that they will continue to be like that because the more you bring more new people in, um, the the culture will change. Yeah. And that's why yeah. I always have a retreat twice a year. This year, oh. 2020 and 2021, I did four. That's because good. I have so many wow. people coming yeah. in. And one of my colleagues were saying, asking me, it's like, how do you pay them? And I said, I pay them the same way. <laughs> I said, but they're not working on the bedside. And I said, who cares? I mean, you know, the return of investment for four hours of retreat is much more than keeping them on the bedside. I said, do you know how much um, comfort they have when you bring them out of the bedside and put them in one place and then you That's just have true. some team building activity? I mean, That's it's true. just like so rewarding for them. Mm-hmm. And true. I said, I will do that. And nobody had told me I shouldn't do it. Finance people didn't say I shouldn't do it. Wow. I mean, I kept on doing it. Yeah. You're lucky. But they see the outcome, though. <laughs> I mean, my volume, the acuity. I mean, you know, MICU is not, um, and Cindy will know this, they're not really money making like cardiac and cancer patients. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But we keep the beds full and yeah. our turnover of patients is fast. We make them um, mm-hmm. go to another or, or transfer to the floor very fast. We take care of them very well. And so they see that. That's mm-hmm. why they, they really mm-hmm. don't question me when I, I make those decisions. I I, I'm happy. I'm happy I could make the decision. I've been <laughs> in a place where every single, it's like nickel and dime. It's a for-profit world before Mass General. That's true. And I know I was aching so bad. And I said to them, I'm going to have to leave because my the my values are not the same. I said, I each patient deserves a staff. And if they're not going to provide that, I don't see me running a, a, a healthcare environment that nurses are seeing being seen like just a pawn or like mm. a body they, yeah. they're not mm-hmm. and i'm so glad i moved to um saint elizabeth's i it was saint elizabeth's before i moved to mass general and oh. it was more rewarding yeah. there that's true yeah that's true good to hear yeah so as you're hiring these new nurses uh jeanette um so if a lot of them probably this, like you mentioned, you know, some are zero to one year experience and some are like one to five. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you finding to be their challenges and how are you addressing them? Now, I heard you talk about focus groups, retreats, um, but what are their major uh, concerns, uh, challenges and issues uh, being new to meet yes. you? Um, and what are you all doing? Yes. Can you share it? Right. To us? So right now, because half we still have COVID, we only had one day. That was the mm-hmm. uh, the tail end of the Joint Commission visit. We only have one day when we have zero COVID patient. Just one day, mm-hmm. we were able to transfer our last COVID patient that was in June. And then from then on, we're still getting COVID patients. And now it's half of my floors, again, COVID patients. So that's a challenge is to maintain the mental and emotional, psychological well-being mm. of my staff because of all these unvaccinated patients. And so I have to be very thoughtful on making sure they are well supported, not necessarily their skill set, because I have 
um, a lot of resources like attending RNs, the resource, my clinical nurse specialist, but more so mm -hmm. for them to feel good about what they do, even though we have deaths left and right, mm -hmm. uh, patients mm -hmm. are not doing well. It's emotionally challenging for newer staff. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm focusing on. It's really for their mental and, and, and emotional well-being. Um, so we have, um, and that's why I was still uh, doing some focus group resiliency rounds and things like that. Then the second part is the skill set. So, of course, like 60% are less than um, five years. 30% of that 60 are one year. And, of course, they don't have the skill set yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm right. worried that come winter time, we have like nine ECMOs again, and they are not ready for that yet. So I told my clinical nurse specialist, we got to have to speed up. We have like in the times of pandemic, the way you do things before is not going to work. Yeah. You got to really have to, mm. your mindset should change. Like my clinical nurse specialist, mm -hmm. she says, okay, they have to be at least two years in the MICU before they could take an ECMO <laughs> patient. I said, no, <laughs> no, we will do it by skill set and readiness. Mm -hmm. If the staff are mm -hmm. ready, and you know, these millennials and Gen Zs, oh, yeah. they're so bright. They're mm -hmm. like a sponge. You tell them something and they know it. So mm -hmm. I said, that's what you're going to have to do. Like, mm -hmm. find out who among the staff are ready. And I don't care if you're only one year. you got to have to train them. Mm -hmm. And give them all the ammunition so that they have the opportunity to, to learn at the bedside while we still have all the seasoned nurses. So that's basically mm -hmm. where the challenges I have. Um, the third challenge is recruitment and retention. And honestly, I'm not worried about that as of yet. Like as of today, I still have about three people lined up to come to me between January and March. My, uh, I will worry about the eight that I have to replace when they graduate in May. But I already have mm -hmm. plans to um, bring in a new grad in March again, about three of that and then i will start recruiting from outside mm. but as early as december I so see. i just have to be very ahead i see yeah mm -hmm. so um vaccination mandates was you, you yes. massachusetts affected by that you know yes Oh, yes, okay. we did. Um, uh, Governor Baker um, mandated all hospitals to uh, have our employees um, vaccinate, be vaccinated. We did lose a few employees. Uh, like I, again, mm. in my unit didn't. Um, uh. All of them got vaccinated, even to the last minute. They said, "Yeah, they keep they keep um, pushing it back up to the very deadline," and then um, and they were able to. But we did in some of the areas that we did lose a few. Um, mm -hmm. nurses, they jumped to New Hampshire because it's not mandated there. Oh, so many nice. of my colleagues lost nurses to a neighboring state that is not mandated. Oh. Um, I think part of the, of the state's um, mandating vaccination is because mm -hmm. Boston is a medical mecca. We have a lot oh, of hospitals here, and so and and so if they don't mandate it, um, they're afraid that it's a high risk That's for right. patients as mm -hmm. well as for healthcare workers That's to be true. exposed. Mm -hmm. So um, I mm -hmm. personally feel that it's a good thing that we mm -hmm. did that. Um, I do understand that it's a right of an individual to refuse, but again, my. My, I always talk to the staff about your moral and ethical um, principles that, yes, you need to compromise. Yes, it's a right. It's our, the liberty. United States is very big on that. Mm -hmm. It's a right to choose what you want. But you also have to mm -hmm. compromise with the fact that you are protecting the health of the nation. And therefore, mm -hmm. you've got to have to compromise your values or your beliefs in order to protect the health of the nation. Mm -hmm. And so they understood, yeah, you know, and um, mm -hmm. I, I, I will be very honest. There were several patients who were unvaccinated um, and it, it really broke my heart. It was um, mm -hmm. uh, one of them was a young, um, they were not immigrant. They don't have, um, they are here to work and they, um, there's from, Hispanic and Black Americans, and they went to Boston for a job. 
Mm-hmm. So they don't really have, um, they don't have any vis- visa at all. Mm-hmm. And um, she was pregnant. Mm-hmm. And her fiance and her didn't want to get vaccinated because A, they're afraid of the complication. Uh-huh. If they have complication, they're going to be out of work. So they don't have any means to sustain uh-huh. themselves. They don't have health insurance. So the, that's the reason why they don't want to get vaccinated. I Unfortunately, see. they got COVID, the, mm-hmm. the, the mother. The, so we delivered her baby, thank God, um, sent her to the NICU. Uh-huh. But unfortunately, she passed away. She didn't make it. But yes, just in the nick of time on the day that she was going to pass, our social work was able to get custody of the child to the father. Uh They work it in City Hall because they're not married yet. Uh So we were able to get her her husband or her fiancé to get custody of the child. Otherwise, it will be um, awarded to the state. It's just wow, so sad. That's true. In fact, yeah, my staff are putting together like gifts for them for Christmas. Oh, they will that's be our. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. It was so that nice. It's so nice. Um, getting some work clothes for the um, for the husband, and our um, our legal department are also trying to get them an immigrant status oh, wow. because the baby is an American citizen. She was oh, born here. Oh, that's right. Like I think they should. They can do that. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So you know, so good things and really sad things. But um, yeah. right. But that's sometimes true. I do understand why people doesn't want to be vaccinated. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I will still st- support vaccination. Really true. <laughs> I think that's the only way yeah. we will be able to get through this, especially oh. with this new variant that's coming out. You yeah. know, and um. And I don't know. I mean, I don't. I mean, California did a very good job containing your COVID. Um, Florida and Texas, I think, and um, Northwest is not as as um, as I think contained as well as um, California. Mm-hmm. I think New York is right. still uh, devastated by it. Boston has been fine. We are one of the well vaccinated mm-hmm. state in the mm-hmm. nation, mm-hmm. so that's yes. good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. Good. it's a lot. Yeah. So how are you now, Jeanette? Um, I mean, you, you, you did, you know, you had COVID, yeah, you're back to well, work. Trying, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. One of my, um, my focus right now is making sure that I have all, no long-term complication uh, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. my pulmonologist says that I should have PFT, like pulmonary function test mm-hmm. every year. I have to go back to my colonoscopy because I haven't really gone back since it was um, canceled uh, two years ago, um, 2020. So I have to make sure I, yeah. I take care of myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I exercise yeah. a lot now. I put on weight again after I lost about 25 pounds in two weeks during my illness. So I had to put it back in a healthy way. So I'm, I'm really focusing on that right now. Um, the... Filipino Cancer Network of New England is kind of a baby to me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm really, I'm really very passionate about helping our president, Chief Abraham, um, making sure we are able to help the community. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like that, and I, I, I'm going back to school. I'm, I'm actually oh. uh, on my first class. It's, it's, I, it's not a course. It's not a course, it's not a uh, matriculated one, but it's more of a credential. It's called the Public Leadership Credential at Harvard Kennedy School. Mm. So I just finished my first course. The next one is in January. So I'm trying to see um, if I'm going to enroll. It's it's no pressure for you to enroll if you don't want to. Um, But you know, it takes about two years to finish to get the credential mm-hmm. uh-huh. at, at your own pace. So I'm doing that right uh-huh. now. That's that's where my 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 um, focus is. Uh, yeah. And then I'm doing mm-hmm. my book. I um, uh, uh, initially I thought I would just speak about my illness. And then when mm-hmm. I came back to work, I said, oh, my God, there's so much to write about. Uh-huh. So now I'm writing about mm-hmm. uh, post um, uh post my illness, how when I came back to work mm-hmm. and then one year happened and I there's more to <laughs> there's more to write again because the pandemic continues. So yeah, so I'm right. halfway there. Oh. Uh, I already have a title. 
I call it silk thread, which means that uh, one of my nurses says like to me, you know, we're hanging like a thread. And I told them, I said, I hope it's silk thread because Uh it's stronger. It's, Uh you know, flexible. And they said, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's how we are. (laughs) We're so resilient. And I said, okay. So my hope is by 2022, I'll finish it. Oh, wow. That's a great... um aspiration i wish i can yes. be like you yeah that will be the first <laughs> book that i <laughs> i wrote and uh, my staff were telling me um did you get a publisher yet and i said no i don't is it so how are you gonna publish it and i said i'll pay it myself you will <laughs> <laughs> they said, we'll do fundraising for you <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> so no and then teaching me how to get a publisher and things like that and I said okay um, but right now I said you know I need to finish it first and then I'll have it edited and then that's when I'm gonna think about publishing and then they told me no the minute that you write something you start uh, thinking of publishing right away oh. so they're, they're telling me all this um this um, strategies basically so I'm, I'm excited about yeah. it I'm so happy for was, I'm yeah I'm so happy uh, that it's going more on a um, on a positive note for you. Um, yeah, trying to learn more new things. You know, life it's a life learn uh, lifelong learning. Well, yes. we mentioned about Omicron a while ago. So how mm-hmm. is um, UMass preparing for it? Are we preparing? What I mean, you know, are so we preparing for it? They are just contact tracing they're doing a lot of that right now so that's why they found that we have one case um here but uh the the individual is at home um he's doing fine uh and so they're just uh, monitoring everybody Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. like right now like for me for example i and even just a sneeze or a a you know, like cold symptoms, I tell my staff, don't come, go and get tested. Uh-huh. And most of the, most of the void of staffing right now are because of symptoms of the healthcare workers, yeah. because we don't want them to come to work when they are, have symptoms. So I, I have see. many of those. I and see. I think it's a good strategy because um, what if they do test positive and at least you're contained already. Um, and, and, like uh, yesterday, I know that the hospital will start um, doing some testing again, like on site. Oh. Um, and especially with the holidays coming up, people are, mm-hmm. are more like getting together. Um, social distancing yes. is not um, in effect. So we're, we're preparing for that. I it see. did. Uh, our cases went up a little bit after Thanksgiving, which we projected. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it went yeah. down again. So for Christmas and New Year, we're just getting ready for that. I see. That's yeah. good. Yeah, I know. Well, Jeanette, this has been a very wonderful conversation uh, about COVID, getting sick and surviving COVID, mm-hmm. going back to work and managing a medical ICU as a nurse director, writing a book, Silk Thread. <laughs> Uh, this, this, I've, I've enjoyed, uh, we have enjoyed our conversations and to wrap this up, Jeanette, uh, what would you say to those that are still hesitant to get the COVID vaccine? You know, what I'm going to tell them is my story. I didn't know how I got it. I know during the time frame we are not masking yet, and I was mm-hmm. really um, trying to help out. Like I don't go into the patients' room; they don't allow me to go in patients' room. But the minute that they get out of their room, I check on their mask: are they on the right, pro- you know, things like that. And because when we're outside, we don't have a mask; we are a- we. I must have been exposed. But mm. honestly, I can tell them the number of patients that that we lost because they're not vaccinated and they are young and they're leaving like infants, children. And I would be very, um, I would like to see them. This is how it's gonna look like. And you may think that you are immune to it or you're not gonna get affected, but um, you're wrong because anybody can get affected. And many times they will tell us like, you know, intubate me now and you know do things of this can i have this can i have that but it's kind of too late already their their lungs has been full of covid already we can't they cannot survive anymore and they leave their loved ones behind and you don't want that 
you know, yeah. especially the younger right. generation right now, because they feel like uh, it's a myth. They think it was um, mm-hmm. it was one of those um, what do you call this? Like um, like they're attacking United States and other countries mm-hmm. so that they will rule the world. That's how they think. But I told them it's not like that at all. It's really true. I mean, COVID is bad. Yeah. And the vaccine yeah. has proven for you a, a proven avenue to protect yourself. It doesn't say that you cannot be um, diagnosed with COVID again, but at least the complication is less. It's not like when I had right. it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's still very effective. Yeah. That's good. And that's that would that's that's what I'm gonna tell them. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And that is all that we have for this episode. I want to thank our guest, Dr. Jeanette Lavello, and my co-host Mindy Ofiana, our director and producer, Rodney Cahudo, Carol Robles, the PNAA Chair for Communications and Marketing, our advisor, PNAA Foundation President Nancy Hoff, and our executive producers, PNAA President Mary Joy Garcia Dia and PNAA Executive Director Carmina Bautista. Join us every Wednesday here on Rise Up. Until then, keep on rising. See you next Thank week. You. Thank you. Thank you. This publication was made possible by Cooperative Agreement, CDC, RFA, IP 21-2106 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Its contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of CDC, HHS.